Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Notes, huh? Okay. So, uh, very surprised to see this many people up before noon on the third day of the conference. That's very impressive. This must be a group of workers here. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to say that this is my first trip to Singapore, first trip to Asia, and uh, some amazing first impressions. The first is, are there professional shoppers in this town? It is, you can actually shop from one side to the other and never leave a building. It's very amazing. I'm not bringing my wife here, I'll tell you that now. Um, I also wanted to kind of tell you a little bit about my company and who the company I work for, just to uh, let you know what we do uh, might help inform your Im Im uh, impression or opinion of what I say, whether or not it's of value to you. Um, we run a, uh, a game service, uh, online game service business. We also have an advertising sales team. We've been in business for over 10 years. Uh, our main uh, um, claim to fame is basically three things. We have a very unique uh, distribution model. We work with uh, OEM PC manufacturers and now we work with uh, uh, mobile manufacturers. Uh, we install our game service on devices before they ever ship into, into the marketplace or into consumers' hands. And we can pre-install games before they ever uh, leave the docks as well. So we will take a, a group of, of high-performing games and, and pre-install those with our proprietary DRM wrapped around them. And then our business model is enabled and we're able to uh, then monetize those games uh, at a very um, nice clip, actually. Um, the big difference also in what we do is our business model itself, other than you know, partnering with uh, PC manufacturers and, and Android manufacturers now. Our uh, business model is kind of a three-fold, three-tiered business model. We support payments, obviously. We, we sell games. But uh, very uniquely, we rent game sessions, and we do that in a rent-to-own model. Our uh, DRM allows us to um, take a game and break it up into little bits of sessions and then we can uh, use those sessions or al allow users to rent them with our uh, currency which we have had for about seven years now. We have a uh, currency called Wildcoins. Uh, we also have a very strong advertising model uh, in our service and that helps kind of fuel both the purchase model and the rental model. So it's, uh, it's been very successful for us. We've taken that same business model and recently launched our Android game service. We launched back at the end of 2011. It's been uh, six months that's felt like about seven years. We've learned so much uh, more about the Android platform since we launched the service, obviously. But many of the lessons that we've learned running a PC business have, have absolutely applied to, uh, to mobile. So uh, I saw this slide online, and I thought it was fairly, uh, fairly apt. I saw this, this uh, um, graphic. Right now, the, the, the mobile uh, battle is, is really between iOS and, uh, and Android. And we had to make a decision of what platforms we were going to take our service into, and it was, it was fairly easy for us to make the decision to go to Android. Uh, whether this, uh, this slide will change next year is kind of up for discussion. I'm sure we could have interesting conversations about whether Metro or, or BlackBerry uh, breaks into to being relevant in terms of size and scale. But right now, our, it was easy for us to make the, the choice to, uh, to go to, to Android because well, obviously, iOS is not an open platform. So this is also uh, you know, supporting our decision to, to, to uh, go to Android. I'm sure if you've been to other mobile sessions, you've seen slides similar to, similar to this. Android is, is absolutely you know, gaining in traction. We're having massive adoption of users into the platform. Uh, over 50% of users, uh, when this was uh, taken back in February, were on Android. And uh, iOS was shrinking. And obviously, all the other platforms were also shrinking. Um, Microsoft is, it will be interesting to see what happens when Win 8 comes out. We think they'll, they'll get some more traction. Uh, but right now it's, it's really a two-person two battle. When uh, Android launched, uh, you know, they, there were some problems with the way that the platform monetized. If you look at how iOS monetizes versus, versus Android, it, it's, it's really, it, it's getting beat up. It's, it's, it's got a black eye. And there were some real reasons for that. There, I think Android made, you know, Google made some, some big mistakes when they, when they first launched their platform. The early problems, some, some of the things that they did wrong, no one knew about their, their DRM. It was a difficult uh, transition for most game uh, makers. There was no filter for content, so there was a real problem with uh, uh, piracy, um, bad games. You know, you'd, you'd go to the, to the uh, Google Play Store, back when it was called something different. But, uh, 
there would be uh, a screensaver that was disguised as a game, and people were just, you know, getting ripped off. So that doesn't uh, lead customers to trust the, the platform. There was no carrier billing initially. That's a real problem for a mobile platform. Without carrier billing, you're cutting out 70% of your monetization. That's, uh, you just can't do that. Side loading of apps is, is a real problem for an average user. It looks scary. You have to go through multiple steps and people are lazy. So side loading apps was a, a big mistake. It's, it's, it was a big problem. A lot of broken games, a lot of security concerns. Confusing market because everyone had to go through Google Checkout and no one knew what Google, Google Checkout was. No one had an account there. So uh, there was also device confusion, fragmentation. Very, very uh, difficult platform to develop for, as I'm sure you all know, when they change the operating system as, as often as they were doing. So lots of problems. There was also some things missing with Android. and. This, uh, we studied the, the, the market fairly well as we were developing our, our app to, to launch into Android. Quite a few things. Number one, there was no curated store. That is a problem uh, when discovery is very difficult for, um, for game makers um, or for, for game players. Uh, payment, payments were not seamless, very difficult to, uh, to pay for games. Lack of ready-made audience. When um, uh, uh, Kindle Fire, when Amazon launched, they had users already. They had credit cards. They had PayPal accounts. They had a, a ready-made user base that allowed them to jumpstart and be successful very quickly, whereas Google just did not have that. There were some things that might have been self-fulfilling prophecies that uh, um, kind of hurt the, the, uh, the market as well. One, customers seemed less willing to pay for games, and they expected free things, maybe because there were a lot of free games, and it was hard to pay for things. Also, there were some very poor games that came out. Porting of an iOS game to Android without a lot of um, detailed um, Q&A on how the game played. How does it work on those devices? We've, we tested 200 games when we first started licensing them. We could only publish 20 of the 200 we tested because they just simply did not work on the platform. Well, all of the bad things that I've said uh, may may uh, make you think that we, we didn't uh, think there was much of an opportunity for the future, but we, we really believe, and I'm, I'm very bullish on Android, and it's pretty simple. There's a massive consumer adoption of Android. Right now, if you look at this is the uh, United States uh, market, North, uh, this is not North America, this is U.S. only, uh, smartphones are um, uh, Non-smartphones is a huge market for, uh, for Android and iOS to go after. So we think that Android and Apple will be fighting it out and getting massively larger audience in the future. Also, if you look at the projections worldwide on, on growth of where smartphones are, we're just at the beginning. We're just at the beginning of this massive launch of a new user base, a, new, a whole new platform. So we're very bullish on that, and we want to be a part of this kind of a curve versus this kind of a curve. Some interesting numbers. Right now, there are over 850,000 new Android devices activated every day. I, I still find that hard to believe, and yet I, I found that uh, um, quoted in many sources. It's a massive number of new, new people coming in every day. Android is uh, continuing to dominate the smartphone market. Uh, back at the end of uh, 2011, they had over 50% market share at the end of uh, last quarter, they had jumped up to 61 percent, and Apple was dropping. They were down to 29 percent. So it's, uh, it's a good story for Android, and there's a lot of opportunity to, to fix the ills that have been uh, plaguing the, the platform. So um, I pulled out five elements that I think you need to have in order to succeed on Android, and these are not the only five elements. I'm sure there are many more things that you need, but these are, I, I think, five very key required elements. The first is you need, you need great games. You need fantastic content. I'm assuming you all have that, so we've got that, that slot filled. Second, you need billing ease. You have to be able to get money from customers. And without billing ease, it doesn't matter how great the game is. You also need exposure for the game. If you don't have a marketplace that's easy to use, if you don't have a, uh, a, a way to get your game in front of customers or get the right games in front of customers, it doesn't matter if you do everything else right. You also need multiple business model support, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a minute, and you need to execute well. Those last two uh, 
um, points are, are fairly important, and I, I wanted to kind of dive into those a little bit more. The first, oh, and by the way, the way to make this all work on Android is different than on iOS. You need partnerships. You can't do this alone. Uh, iOS is an open, I mean, a closed system, so you can go to one partner. There's, there's some great things about that, but there's also, also some very thing, scary things about that. Android, you can make multiple partners, you can diversify your business, and you can diversify your risk. But you need to, you need to think about working with partners, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But first, uh, I wanted to mention the multiple business model and why that's important. So I, I've been um, publishing games for uh, six years now and watching how every time you think you understand the market or you think you understand how a game will monetize, you get surprised. Well, it's pretty easy to figure out that not all content is the same. You know, a Gucci bag is not the same as this lovely bag, which I, I found, or this one, which uh, I don't even know what that is. And by the way, that, that purse on the bottom left is uh, actually a $5,000 purse. I wouldn't pay $50 for it, but someone valued it at $5,000. So purses are all different. They're all valued at different amounts. Games are the same. Uh, if you don't have a partner that supports a, by the way, that, that was a 99 cent. I don't know what happened with the square there. Uh, if you don't have a, a, a partner that supports your price point, if you think your, your game is valued at $8 US or eight pounds, uh, euros, uh, you, you, you're, you're not going to be successful. You need to understand your game and the value of it and your partner needs to, to support that price. If they're telling you what to sell your game at, that's not a real partnership. The other things you're, you, you might need are a rental model because not everyone knows about your game. So renting is a great way to get people in to try it at a lower price point. Advertising, you, you need if you uh, are trying to approach customers who will never pay you any money. There are plenty of those out in the world. Uh, I, I have never pulled out my credit card and spent money on uh, a mobile platform. I'll, I've used mobile billing, but I've never used my credit card. On a, uh, a tablet, I'll, I'll use it. Human nature, who could, who could explain that? But the point being, if you don't have a way to monetize customers who aren't willing to pull out their credit cards or pay for the games, then you're just going to lose out on that massive number of people that you could make money with advertising, perhaps. Item purchase, that is, you know, I'm sure you've heard this in every other session, everybody's going to item purchase or in-game purchase. Yeah, that's a great model if, if it works with your game. Uh, if it doesn't work with your game, uh, maybe the value is playing the game and it's not the items in it. Well, then you probably want to support an MSRP. Uh, subscription, even. Now, that, not many people have talked about that, but we've seen there are platforms where subscriptions getting into games on um, handheld devices People are willing to pay a monthly subscription to play to uh, play a game. So let me jump over and talk about execution because on Android you are going to need partners to help you find your audience. First thing, I'm just assuming everybody has made great games. You've picked your distribution partners and you've tested your game on the relevant devices for that partner. It's, I can't emphasize that enough. If you are um, reaching an audience and you haven't check to make sure your game works on the devices that they're on, you're simply not going to be successful. The other thing I could really recommend, and I, I, I think this would be a great thing for everybody in here to have, is a dedicated account manager to deal with those partnerships. If uh, CEO is, is your title, you should not be the dedicated uh, account manager for your, your distribution channel. That needs to be somebody's job uh, that they're held accountable for and that they think about when they get up in the morning to make sure that they've done their communication plan with their partners. They're talking about price changes. They're sending out emails to um, get us excited about release dates and also making sure that we get new builds if you made a fix. We are simply not seeing support of this nature. If you are launching with a partner, I, I beg you, have a plan to support your game and a communication um, person picked that that's their job. That's what they do. Also. Uh, you need to have stripped APKs. And what I'm saying by that is my, my network, for instance, Wild Tangent, we don't take third-party ad networks. We have our own ad network. So we want a, a raw game to, to wrap our DRM around. And if you have a social um, um, APK or uh, API in your game, that's great. Social, social is fine, as long as it doesn't jump over to a storefront. 
you know, we've spent a lot of money to get our, our customers, and if you've got a, a storefront link in your game, we're not going to be real thrilled to have that. Also, uh, organized asset delivery. And my, uh, my team made me put this in the slide because uh, we've, uh, as I mentioned, we've launched about 200 games on, on Android so far, and well over half of them had no marketing copy. So uh, it's a good idea to create a package to sell your game to your partner. Marketing copy, layered art files, um, and a main game image that you've spent some time figuring out is attractive to end users. The other thing I can really stress is be easy to work with. If you are a pain and you're difficult to work with, it's human nature. People will not think of you first when they have an opportunity that would benefit your company. If you're easy to work with and we have an opportunity to put you up on the front page, we're going to, you know, it's, I'm, I'm a human being and so is my team. They'll pick the people they like, the ones that are easy to work with, and those people will get the opportunities. Um, another question we get quite often is, you know, what, uh, what operating system should I be paying attention to? This is fairly easy to figure out. Right now, it's 2.2 and 2.3 cover 86% of the devices that are selling on Google Play, of games that are being sold on Google Play. 3.0, 3.1 to 4. Yeah, they're, they're great, they're sexy devices, but the market isn't there yet. So think lowest common denominator. Think back to how many devices were shipped with these older operating systems, and if your game doesn't work on it, you're cutting out 86% of your market right out of the bat. Um, I also want to talk about curated uh, storefronts versus non-curated. I'm sure um, some smart people in here can figure out what store this is that I'm, I'm displaying. Uh, but up until a few uh, months ago, all you saw in these open stores were uh, 99 cent games, $1.99 games, or free games. Now you're starting to see some uh, interesting 4.99, Grand Theft Auto, um, Minecraft, 6.99. That that's starting to change in those markets, and they're 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 seeing that that higher price games uh, do work. Also, um, if you look at number six, Fruit Ninja, a dollar twenty-two is not a price point in North America. So that, that game was obviously priced someplace else, and that is a currency conversion. You have to watch those things. Uh, and a, a, a North American audience will look at $1.22 and go, what does that mean? It, it makes them, they, it puts them off. Um, Ala, who is, I don't know if she's in here now, she gave a talk yesterday about the differences between uh, cultures. Uh, in, in America, if you stand closer than this to somebody, you're intruding on their, their personal space. Oddly enough, if you price a game at the wrong amount, it's tantamount to standing too close to somebody. They'll just, they don't know why, they don't feel comfortable, they're not going to buy it. They feel like they're getting ripped off. This is a curated storefront. Uh, this is a Verizon app store. And if you look at the, de the top devices that, by the way, these devices on, on this slide and on this one here are by order of uh, the revenue that they generate. Um, this is a completely different picture from the other one. Look at the price points, $399, $799. You've even got, if you look at every, pri every, every, every um, game on here that has an asterisk next to it, that is a monthly subscription price. So do not um, just fall into the trap of there's only one price point that, that fits everything. That's just not the case. People value games differently. Um, go back to my example of the purses. Uh, some benefits of curated storefronts. Obviously, you get greater visibility of games because you've got a hand-picked catalog. You've got filters, so you don't have to worry about copyright infringement. Um, no one's going to be stealing your IP by putting up a fake version of your game. You've got community, developer community support. You basically, if you have questions about what's going on in the platform, you've got people that will help you. Uh, we have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm including Wild Tangent in this uh, um, curated uh, benefits model as well as Verizon. We have additional billing models. We're working with partners and getting carrier billing done on the back side. So if you in, uh, work with us, put one game live with us, you get all of our partners billing as well. That's, that's a, a great value. So let me, let me just change gears here for a second, talk about customers, because um, knowing who your customer is, is is extremely important. We have done some uh, surveys on our service recently, and we've found some surprising results. Number one, uh, I wanted to share this particular question. We asked our, our user base, we have over 12 million people a month who play in our service. We asked them what kind of phone they had. And I'm sure everybody has their own guesses here about what the answers were. I, I 
probably am going to surprise you with the fact that over 50% of our audience had no clue over what kind of phone they had. <laughs> we were marketing our service as an Android service. No one knows what Android is. Consumers do not know. They know that they have a Sony phone or a Samsung or an HTC or an Apple. If you ask them, you know, do you have an iOS, they'll go, what's iOS? They have no clue. So that's, it's important to keep that in mind because we start to talk our own language and we're thinking of, and talking to each other, but we're not thinking about our customers and thinking about what they understand and what they know. Um, just try and get on the phone and help my dad save a file sometime on his PC and you'll know what I'm saying. So who is a typical Android customer? That's, that's an interesting one. Um, we have Skeeter. He's, uh, I think he works at uh, Kenny Rogers Roasters. That's his favorite tree. It's an elm tree. We've got uh, Gregory who works on Wall Street. By the way, Gregory has never paid us anything. He's too smart. He's an advertising customer. We can't get his money. Um, Maggie, who just uh, had a hip replacement. She fell on some ice six months ago and she plays games every day eight hours a day. She is actually a core gamer. And uh, Uncle Slappy, this guy, I'm sure people have Uncle Slappies in their family. He, uh, um, by the way, he's feeding an alligator with bacon, I think, in that. Uh, he's also an advertising customer because he doesn't have credit cards and he has no money in the bank. Uh, and then Meg Ryan is also an Android user. So the, my point is there's no typical customer on Android and if you're trying to make your game fit a typical customer, you're probably going to fail because we, we are all special snowflakes in the world. And Android has got such a huge install base that you simply can't try and, and, and categorize people and put them into one particular um, uh, bucket. So what can you do with that information? I think you can, you can take some rules about game design. Number one, and this is a rule that I, I really believe in, it's called KISS, keep it simple, stupid. And I'm not sure if we're stupid or Uncle Slappy is in this example, but the point is uh, people will not read, number one rule. If you are putting any kind of text in your mobile game, people are not going to read it. They just, just watch how, they, how people's attention spans these days are so, so short. So do not put overly uh, verbose text in your game. Number two, three menu screens is three too many. If you've got a menu screen, you're putting something in, in, in between the customer, the, the game player, and, and his experience, they're not gonna, gonna stick around. They're gonna go um, finger paint with their friends. You know, they, they've got a, other things to do. And by the way, finger paint with their friends is draw something. I'm sure everybody knows that. Uh, your UI should be unnoticeable, meaning if, if I have to figure out how your UI works, how to navigate around in the game, I'm not gonna play your game. I've got other things to do. Uh, game mechanics for phones must be intuitive. Now, you could say the same is kind of true for, for uh, iPad, or for, um, sorry, I was gonna say iPads, uh, for tablets, but uh, tablet users have a little bit more patience to learn how to play your game. They're gonna be sitting down with their tablet and using it in a different setting typically than on the go, but phone players, people who are using a phone are not gonna stick around to figure out how your mechanic works if it is not intuitive, they can't figure it out right away, they're on to the next thing. So, um, men hunt and compete with each other. This is a general rule that we've seen across our network. Uh, women collect and cooperate. Now, not everyone is this way, okay? I'm sure women will hunt and I'm sure men collect. But in general, men like to compete in games and women like to cooperate. And if you break that rule, either one of those rules, you better know what you're doing because um, quite often people are just not going to understand what you're trying to accomplish if it doesn't fit what they believe. If you, if, for instance, if you go see a movie and it's not a three-act movie, you, you, it just doesn't feel right to you. Same thing here. When men like to do certain things when they play games. Women like to do other things. We're, we're strange creatures. Uh, the other thing I, I really recommend for you to do is to find what the value is in your game and then charge for it. Now, if that means access to the game, then you want, a re uh, you want an MSRP, you want a, uh, a retail model of charging to, to play the game. If uh, new levels is, is the value, charge for the new levels and do in-game uh, purchase. If it's power-ups, then you're definitely going to want to do in-game purchase. So that, that's a, quite often people simply miss that trick. What is the value of the game? Charge for it. And uh, just ask your customers what they value. 
So how do you become a crossover artist and apply to, you know, appeal to all those different customers on Android? The first thing you have to do is apply the KISS rule. Don't get in your own way. If you, if you create problems for your, for your customers, your game players, to get into the game, you've lost right off the bat. Number two, and I don't know if many people have talked about this, but I'm a big believer in passion. You know, when I, when I sit down and talk to a game developer and I see a gleam in their eye and they're like, this game is so fun, you're going to love it, I'm putting that in the home page front and center right away. Because if they believe it, I believe it. So if you bring passion to the, t to the game, you make a hook, and the hook in the, in, the, in the game is really the gameplay, is it fun, then you've connected emotionally with your users, and that is terrific, because uh, emotional users will buy your game. The other thing is you need to burn from the first bar. That's a rock and roll uh, analogy. When you listen to rock and roll, they, they jump right into the, into the song, and you hear the hook almost immediately. If you don't do the same thing with your game, meaning don't put the best part of the game in level three or level five. Put the best part of the game in level one and level two all the way through level five. So you've got, you've got one chance to make a first impression and on mobile phones, you've got about 30 seconds if you're lucky. And if you haven't grabbed someone in that time frame, you're never gonna grab them. The other thing is make the game that you wanna play. Again, back to the passion. If you don't wanna play your game, it's very doubtful that anyone else will. Now, in, in that may sound fairly common, like it's common sense, but very, very often I talk to people who go, what do you think the people on your network want to play? I'll make that game for them. Um, do they like hookah pipes? Should we put 15 hookah pipes in a level and let them go look for them? Like, do you like looking for hookah pipes? Because if you don't, don't put it in your game. If that's what turns you on and you really, really enjoy that, by all means, make, put it in there because someone else will connect with what you believe, what your passion is. Passion inspires people. And game players want to be inspired, and inspired people buy things. So I, I really believe that if you're making the game out of your heart and you love it, you will, you will find your audience, you'll connect. Uh, by the way, Taylor Swift owns an HTC sensation. I'm pretty sure she's, she's also an, an Android user. Uh, this may be uh, some advice that uh, you may not have thought I might say to you, and that's I think you should spend time at retail to figure some things out about how to market your game. Why would you do that? Well, I've been uh, watching people shop for 20 years. I started off my career in retail, and I've learned not only how to spot um, shoplifters very easily and quickly, but also I've learned how people make decisions on purchasing. People make purchase decisions instantaneously. We like to think that we're rational creatures, but we're, we're not. What's that? Got it. It's like, wow, that's cool. Uh, so if you ask somebody after they make a purchase why they made that purchase, very often they'll say, oh, well, I, I weighed the, the values and the benefits of both, both things, and uh, you know, this was a better 20% you know, more in this one. Uh, the truth is they probably like the pink dinosaur in the box. So it's, it's not, we are not rational creatures. We do not make choices. Uh, that way, so you have to appeal to the irrational side of people's minds when you, when you go to sell your product. And that's what, what you, your game is. Your game is your retail box. You are trying to sell it to a consumer. So I'll leave you with some last thoughts here. The first is um, all games do not need to be 99 cents. I think I've beaten that one to the, into the ground. Successful games will only be game purchased. There will be successful games that are, uh, are in-game in purchase. Some games will be rental, some will be free to play, some will be um, monthly subscription. <laughs> also, having your game in one location is not all you need. When I've talked to partners, I, you know, I, I hear them say, oh, well, we're already you know, doing a deal with, a, with an OEM, so we don't need help getting uh, exposure. That's just crazy, that's insane. The more shelf space you can get, and that's what partners are giving you is shelf space, the better off you're going to be. Um, someone asked me also, and I just I threw this slide up here, and, and I'll share this online. I think uh, um, you can get this information um, from, uh, from Casual Connect. This, these are the devices that we test on, and we change this constantly. Um, we are also releasing a white paper uh, next month, which will talk about things that we've learned, working with uh, all the carrier partners, the OEM manufacturers, um, and we'd be more than happy to share that information with you. So that is it. Thank you.
think I answered all questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.